Hello, and welcome to today's security awareness training, how to identify and prevent phishing attacks. My name is Eleni Lepo, and I'm the marketing director here at Kite Technology. Also joining me is Dylan Fernaro. He's Kite Tech security engineer and your presenter today. Since October is Cybersecurity Awareness Month, we thought this would be the great time to do a session on this topic, especially since cyber threats are ongoing and increasing. We hope that today's session will arm you with some good information on how to better recognize and therefore avoid these kind of attacks. Just as a brief introduction of Kite Technology, since some of you may not have heard of us before, we're a managed IT service company and consulting firm, and we've uh, served businesses across the United States. We've been around for more than 30 years now, and our goal is to help the organizations that we partner with leverage technology to improve performance and to operate more securely. We work with businesses in many different industries, such as insurance agencies, accounting firms, nonprofits, healthcare practices, and many more. I've listed some of the services that we provide here on this slide. So if you'd like to learn a little more, feel free to send us a comment or a question in the question pane during the presentation, and we'll be sure to reach out to you after the session. And with that, I'm going to hand the presentation over to Dylan to introduce himself and get started with our training. Dylan, it's all yours. Thanks, Lenny. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Dylan. I am the security engineer over here at Kite. Uh, my day-to-day -day focus is solutions development in regards to security, uh, regulatory compliance, organizational risk assessments, and incident response. Um, here is today's agenda. So today, we're going to be looking at a few things such as you know, why phishing is a serious threat. Um, some common types of phishing attacks, a few red flags that can help you identify and a phishing attempt and some do's and don'ts, uh, and, and a few best practices for protecting your business. Our main goal today is to provide you with a more basic approach to defending against these types of attacks um, by explaining some core concepts around phishing that we feel everyone should understand. So why is phishing a serious threat? To understand why phishing is a serious threat in the first place, you have to first understand what exactly phishing is. Um, we've all heard of the term before, uh, but it can be more involved than a spam email, right? Phishing is more of a blanket term uh, used to describe someone utilizing social engineering techniques to either you know, trick someone into providing data, uh, which could be used to steal their information, compromise account, or deploy malware. The crazy thing is, in just the first quarter of this year, over a million successful uh, phishing attacks occurred. And that's why it's so important to understand how to protect yourself against these types of threats. So why exactly is phishing a serious threat to you and your business? Well, let's look at some examples. Email accounts. They're commonly used to reset passwords on other services. So if your email account is compromised, then the threat actor can then utilize that email account to get into other services. Because a lot of the times when you're signing up for something, be it a website or a service, they require an email address, right? This is usually used to log in or reset your password in the event you forgot or wanted to change it. If that email is compromised, anyone with access to it can reset your passwords for any of the accounts and services that are using that email address. Single sign-on. With the adoption of what we call single sign-on, um, certain identity providers can be used to log into multiple services. For example, you've probably used your Gmail account or your Microsoft account uh, to sign up for things, different websites such as Facebook, or maybe even your line of business application. If that account gets compromised, then all of those services are at risk as well. Another one is employee email accounts may and more than likely will contain some sort of non-public information or sensitive data. Uh, we work with data such as social security numbers, credit card numbers, and a whole bunch of other non-public information all the time. If that data is stolen, it could open up your organization to fines and potential lawsuits. This can cost the company thousands to millions of dollars depending on the types of data they handle. Also, if a business is handling regulatory data, a notification of breach to their customers may be required based on state and federal law. This can put companies out of business and is extremely damaging to their reputation, which is hard to come back from. 
Phishing is also used to push things like malware across company networks and systems. Um, by doing this, it can bring them down completely halting their everyday business, which further increases the damage done. And these are just a few examples. And while the list could continue on and on of why phishing is a serious threat, um, it's a good idea to understand that, you know, some of the more important ones to keep an eye out for. So there are a ton of different phishing techniques being developed every day with the intent to bypass security controls and make it harder for end users to notice when an email is fraudulent. All right, so let's take a look at some of the main contenders that you'll probably see on your day to day. Um, the more common phishing attacks. The first one, email phishing. Um, this is the most common type of phishing attack that happens. Most of you have seen it come through email. Um, more than likely, someone has received a phishing attempt more than once in your lifetime. Uh, these emails are created to trick a user into clicking a link, usually opening an attachment or some other nefarious goal to compromise the end user. The threat actor may spoof the from address to look like the email is coming from a legitimate domain when it's actually not legitimate. These threat actors also may utilize what we call cyber squatting. A common form of cyber squatting is called typo squatting. And an example of this is when someone registers a domain that looks very similar to a legitimate one to trick the user to thinking it's safe. Think facebook.com, but with an extra O in book. However, since most phishing attempts through email are sent out in mass, they usually contain grammatical errors and are easy to catch if you know what you're looking for. Here's an example of what a common email phishing looks like. Um, you can see on here the from address from an Ella Golan Zoom at mail store dot, you know, all of that. And then you can see weird capital letters in um, the body of the message and the grammar is a little bit weird too. Um, and then it's being scanned by avast.com. So just some food for thought when, you know, as what these, these types of emails look like. All right. So while common email phishing attacks are usually sent out to thousands of people at once, um, based on a wide variety of services that they're trying to compromise, um, Spear phishing takes a more targeted approach. Um, and spear phishing kind of is more meticulous, you could say. So the approach attempts to compromise a specific user, uh, the key word here being specific. The threat actor usually has some information on the employee that they're targeting, uh, be it their name, job titles, phone numbers, stuff like that. So all of this information is used with the goal to build legitimacy for their request, making the compromise more likely. Uh, these emails usually are well-crafted from a grammatical standpoint and use words to provide a sense of urgency. Uh, these attempted attacks usually have a goal in mind rather than just compromising an account, um, getting access to financial data, stuff like that, um, intellectual property as well. So the threat actors are usually, you know, after something specific, which can be a little bit more tricky to catch. Here's an example of spear phishing. So we have John Miller here at realfinancialauditor at gmail.com. Um, you see, he starts off by saying, hey, Dylan. So he already has my name. Uh, this is John over at United Financial Services. I'm sure if I would look up that, you know, that business name, it would be something legitimate. Um, he's basically saying my account may be compromised. Um, he has my email here as well. And then he also has possibly, um, in this scenario, we're going to say that he does, the, um, my account ending in 8652. And then he directs me to a link to verify that I'm the owner. Um, so this is an example of a spear phishing, a more targeted approach to compromise. Whaling. So this is another more targeted approach to um, phishing. Whaling is actually a type of spear phishing attack, as it also takes a targeted approach with using previous reconnaissance being done beforehand. So with whaling, though, the threat actor is actually determined to compromise a high-level executive in the company rather than just any specific employee. Um, so the presidents of the company, the C-levels of the company. Um, the target executives usually have access to sensitive information that most employees from the organization don't. Um, if this type of attack is successful, 
the percentage that there will be an additional internal compromises drastically increases. And the damage done from this type of compromise can be detrimental to the entire organization. All right, this is an example of whaling. So again, whaling is a form of spear fishing, so it's gonna be a more targeted and direct approach. But we're seeing here that, you know, he's reaching out to me, um, you know, he, he's, he's notifying me of a, I apologize for that. He um, is notifying me of my Chase credit card and of course the account ending in this. Um, and he's saying that's my business's Chase credit card. You know, usually the only the management have a, a company credit card. And then he gives me my address, a phone number, and then please get back to me ASAP as further delays could result in additional fines. Um, so that sense of urgency as well. Smishing. Okay. So smishing is any sort of phishing attempt sent over text messages or any sort of SMS service. Um, it's actually become increasingly more common over the last few years. Uh, most of you have probably received some sort of smishing attempt show up in your text messages, common ones being a message that says your bank account has been locked out or that you need to approve a charge on your credit card. So these messages usually contain links that will attempt to steal your credentials by either sending you to a malicious website or just stealing browser cookies to hijack an already authenticated, authenticated session. And here we have an example of smishing. So of course, it's a number that's not in your contacts. Um, it's saying, you know, it's from American Express and then it gives you a link to an American Express message.com. Um, that you are uh, more than likely doesn't go to that direct website. Cool, okay, so vishing. Um, vishing is similar to smishing, but it's conducted over the phone, so voice. Um, it attempts, vishing attempts usually will have someone call you and pretend to be from a legitimate company like Microsoft or your bank again, and attempt to trick you into downloading something or giving them information. Um, we're actually see, starting to see a decrease in overall vishing attempts thanks to some initiatives by the FCC. Uh, and there are also new technologies being developed by phone manufacturers and wireless carriers um, to help catch and prevent these types of calls before they even reach your phone. So that's nice. And then here's a, a transcript of an example of a vishing um, attempt. So we have the threat actor here reaching out to me saying, how are you today? This is John over at Bank of America Security Operations Center. Um, Hi, John, I'm doing well and yourself, what's going on? And then of course the threat actor, good, good. Hey, I got an alert here about a possible fraudulent charge on your credit card and wanted to make sure the money isn't taken out of your account. And I'm, you know, me being me. Oh, wow, thanks for letting me know. Uh, what do you need from me? And then he follows up with, you know, before I can do anything, could you verify your date of birth and the last four of your social security number? There's one red flag right there. Um, and then he follows up, up with saying, I'm also trying, I'm also going to send you a verification to your phone. Um, read that out to me once you've received it. So a lot of times with that is they already have your password to your email account. And if your email or email or bank account, and if your bank or email account have multi-factor authentication on it, well, they're going to attempt to log in and pretend that that code that they're sending you is for their purposes, not actually to get into your account. Okay, so red flags to help you identify phishing attempts. So there isn't a one size fits all approach to identifying a phishing attempts, um, but there are some common, common red flags that should raise an alert and prevent you from acting on the request. So let's take a look at a few. Spelling and grammatical errors. One of the biggest things to look out for is spelling and grammatical errors. We've all been there and accidentally spelt a, something wrong or used the word out of context. Um, but you will usually be able to tell the difference between a small mistake and a completely botched email from a grammatical standpoint. And again, the spelling and grammatical errors ones are usually going to be the generic. Um, you're going to see that usually in the generic uh, email phishing, not necessarily the spear phishing and whaling attacks. Um, but it's always something good to keep a look, at, keep an eye out for. Sense of urgency. Okay, so 
you'll hear things like, I need this done right now or the payment isn't going to go through or please hurry because I have an appointment that I need to get to. Um, there are just a few examples of how someone may try and get you to move you know, quickly before you know, thinking about the request that they're asking. Uh, this is why verification processes are so important. Even if they make the workflow a little inefficient, um, all of us are busy people and it's common for us to want to get the work done so that we can move on with our day. Um, this is why a sense of urgency is such a common tactic used to try and trick the end user. So if something seems a bit too urgent, take a step back and think before you continue on with the conversation. Infrequent contact. So if we aren't in the role of onboarding a new client or user, most of the time, the people that we talk to on the day-to-day -day basis or our contacts at a specific company usually won't change very frequently. And if they do, we are usually made aware of that role change ahead of time. There are even controls in the back end regarding email protection that will actually notify you if you haven't spoken to a user before or the contact was infrequent. That's why it's important to question any time that you receive an email from someone who you haven't heard before, especially if their request seems unordinary. Which leads me to this, unusual requests. I'm sure we've all heard of the scam where some, someone poses as the CEO or president of a company and they ask an employee to buy gift cards. Um, while we all love to be rewarded for our hard work, this is usually considered an unusual request. Any request for confidential information in general should raise an alert. Uh, if your company deals with payments or wire transfers, a newer approach to this type of attack is to request payments using cryptocurrency or asking to use a third-party payment platform such as Venmo or PayPal. These types of strange requests can be common and it's always best to reach out to the person in question directly over the phone before moving forward. A generic initial greeting. So the companies that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis will more than likely know your name. If an email starts off with a generic sounding greeting like dear sir or madam, that should raise a red flag. While it's not always going to be an indication of a phishing email, it's definitely something to be aware of. Um, and while because it's not really that hard to get someone's name to use in a phishing attempt, as sometimes it's just right in their email address. Um, but a generic greeting in general should make you think before moving forward or at least provide you with a sense that you need to verify further. The from address doesn't match the company's name or a company's domain. So this one is a little tricky because this method of detecting fraudulent emails isn't foolproof anymore because some of the spoofing technologies that are available um, will allow these to be, you know, this, it would cause them to not necessarily give you the proper information. However, it is a good first step if you feel a little uneasy about the email possibly being a phishing attempt and can help rule out a lot of the less sophisticated phishing attacks. Um, you're usually going to only see this type of stuff on those more direct targeted approaches. Um, if it's coming from a domain that uses the company name, but it isn't the normal email you're used to seeing them contact you from, think microsofttechsupport.com rather than microsoft.com or possibly a Gmail account rather, rather than a company's registered domain. It's probably malicious. Okay, so let's go over some do's and don'ts to help you defend against phishing. Um, while red flag may help you identify whether something is a phishing attempt or not, there are some workflow changes that you can make as well to help protect yourself against phishing attempts. Slow down. Take your time when responding to an email, a phone call, or a text message. Think to yourself about the red flags before you respond, especially if your gut is telling you something may be off. The faster we perform tasks, the higher chance of making a mistake, which leads to a higher chance of being compromised. Validate the request. So you can always validate the request by calling the sender directly. It never hurts to be too cautious 
if you're communicating with someone and something feels off, just give them a call. If some if someone is attempting to a person impersonate another person, I'm sure they would want to be made aware. This will also give the person being impersonated a goal to notify their own company and clients to be on the lookout. Keep your information locked down. You're going to want to purge your social media accounts of all non-public information and any personally identifiable information. The more data that you have on someone, the easier it is to deceive them. So your best bet is to go ahead and remove all of that MPI and PII that's available on any of your social media accounts. And after you do that, lock down them, lock down those accounts um, by changing your profiles to private so that only accepted requests can view your account. Keep your computer and applications up to date. Keeping these things up to date is a huge deterrent for common attacks. Many phishing attempts will utilize exploits in out-of-date software that will only require you to click on a link or open an attachment to compromise your account. Making sure that you're turning on auto updates is crucial to protecting yourself from the latest exploits threat actors may be attempted through phishing. Now we're gonna to get to some don'ts. Okay, so don't click on links directly. We just talked about how clicking on a link may cause an exploit to go through and compromise your account, right? So if you're concerned about a link, especially a shortened URL, hover over it with your mouse to see a pop-up of where it's actually taking you. If you have a link in an email to a web page that doesn't seem right, bring up your browser directly and go to the website. You can also copy and paste the link on the website virustotal.com, um, which will scan it against a database of malicious URLs. And they have a good reputation for coming back with um, le legitimate data. Don't blindly open attachments. So don't open attachments without scanning them first. If an attachment sent to you, download the attachment and scan it with your antivirus software before opening it. Um, you can also forward and submit suspicious email attachments to Microsoft directly or websites like VirusTotal, like we spoke on before, uh, to scan on your behalf. Or if you can, reach out to your IT provider and have them verify the, uh, the attachment's integrity themselves. Don't send sensitive information over email or text message. So... It's always best to exchange non-public information over the phone, but we do understand that sometimes emailing this type of information is necessary. So if you must send data such as credit cards or social security numbers, be sure that it's at least encrypted and deleted afterwards, just in case your account or device is compromised later on. Don't use the same password across different websites and services. This one is crucial. We all know that it's hard to remember all of your passwords for every single website and service out there. Try adopting a password manager into your workflow to help create strong passphrases without the need to remember them all in your head. If an account uses the same credentials as a compromised one, it's essentially compromised as well. This will be a good time to also implement some sort of dark web scanning to see which credentials you've used have been compromised. Some password managers actually have this feature built in, and the, uh, this will alert you to what passwords you need to change and what sites you need to change them on. And it will also make sure that you're not reusing passwords across different sites and services. Okay, so let's look at some best practices for safeguarding your business. How do we protect our business from these types of threats, or at least mitigate the damages done in an event of a compromise? There's not a one-size-fits-all solution to safeguarding your business from these types of attacks. This is why in the field of security, we'd like to take what we call a layered approach and implement multiple controls to mitigate the threats that are targeting your organization. Let's go over a few that every business should adopt as a standard solution. Multi-factor authentication. Okay, I'm sure you've all heard of this and are currently using it in some way, shape, or form. Um, a lot of times an end user who falls for a phishing attack will usually realize they messed up 
once they handed over their password. That's why it's important to implement a form of multi-factor authentication on your accounts, as it's crucial to protecting that password compromise from moving to an entire account compromise. Next is conditional access GUIP, GUIP filtering for logins. So conditional access policies use logic to determine whether an account should be allowed to log in based on certain parameters. Um, those parameters can be set to things such as allowed devices, uh, security control requirements, uh, and even geographical locations. If you have the ability to implement conditional access policies or something similar, it will greatly help prevent an account compromise as it enforces these controls across the entire business. Heard your company's social presence of MPI. So we kind of spoke on this earlier about what individual users can do with their social media accounts, but it, this also pertains to businesses as a whole. So it's nice to have contact information on your website, right? It allows for your clients to easily find and reach out to the appropriate person for their needs. Things like email addresses, direct phone numbers, extensions, stuff like that. While this may be convenient from a, the standpoint of a client communication, it also provides threat actors with easily accessible intelligence on your co company and employees that can be used for a more targeted approach. It's best to have a department-wide email for client contact and forward them internally to the appropriate person. All right, so refrain from keeping emails past regulatory retention requirements. Again, we spoke on this one earlier for individuals, but we're going to talk about it again through it from a business standpoint, and that's purge emails that contain non-public information. Um, again, a lot of us are dealing with MPI through email communication on a daily basis, you know, social security numbers, driver's license, credit cards. Mailboxes were never meant to be used as a storage account for this type of information specifically. So it's important to implement proper retention, archiving and purging policies to either move this information into a more secure database or just remove it altogether. Spam filtering. Most of you probably are utilizing some sort of spam filtering, um, but it's, best to use the spam filtering pol policies through a third party or your native mail provider. And these policies are the first line of defense in catching phishing attempts sent to your employees. And they should be configured to a proper standard, even if it may delay some emails in the process. Sometimes inefficiency is worth it when it comes to security. Security awareness training and simulated phishing. This is probably something you else you guys are all aware of. So spam filters aren't perfect. If your spam filter fails, which at some point it will, your next line of defense is the recipient of that phishing email, the end user. That's why it's crucial to keep up to date on the latest threats by enrolling your users in security awareness training and simulated phishing exercises in your environment. These solutions are used to teach employees how to identify and protect themselves against all types of threats, not just phishing. DKIM, DMARC, and SPF. So this one's a little bit more of a technical concept and you don't necessarily need to understand how these technologies work. Um, but from a basic standpoint, they're used in the back end to authenticate an email and, and its sender, which then determines what should be done in the event it can't be validated. Like I said, the technology behind how this works isn't relevant to today's webinar. The most important aspect that I want you to take away from this concept is to make sure you're utilizing these solutions by contacting those who are managing your email. Last but not least, cyber liability insurance. Compromised accounts can lead to an entire disruption of a business. Uh, you can be infected with malware, such as ransomware, which will completely lock down your organization and cost the company millions of dollars. It's best to have that peace of mind that you are financially covered in the event this happens to you as these events can put a company out of business. And that's it. Um, I hope today was you know, informative and that you learned at least something to take away from this today.
um, and to help protect you and your business against these types of threats. Uh, so let's jump into some questions. Eleni, uh, what do you have? All right, thank you so much, Dylan. That was awesome, great, great information. And we do have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is from Donna. Um, she asks, is it good to have Norton 360 on all devices? Does it really work? So I'm assuming Norton 360 being the antivirus. Antivirus can definitely help protect, protect you against phishing attacks in the sense that it's going to protect the internal movement from that email address or an email attachment or link into the computer itself. Um, when you're trying to protect yourself against threats actively being pushed through the email itself, you're going to want to look at different types of uh, solutions, whether that's for Office 365, you have um, advanced, set, advanced threat protection policies, and these things automatically scan um, URLs that come over the email and attachments. So Norton is more on the side of local desktop protection, whereas the policies against phishing, you're going to want to kind of look at um, the email protection. All right, we have a question here from um, Edward. Any, recommend, any recommended steps for when a vendor whitelisted domain gets spoofed? Spoofed or not, if you have the proper policies based on what I spoke on in the webinar, the DKIM, the DMARC, and the SPF, um, that is going to play a critical role in preventing that spoofed email address from making it to your mailbox. Um, that would be my recommendation for, for your first step into hoping hopefully preventing those types of attacks um, would be to implement that, that solution. That's, that's basically the best bet when it comes to preventing that. Okay, thank you. Um, another question we have here is from Stephanie. How do we download and scan a document before opening? So um, it really would depend on what mail client you're using, but let's say that you're using Outlook. You can right click and save or click the little drop down on the attachment and click save as, save it to your desktop. Um, and then you can right click and then usually you can scan it with your, your native antivirus. You can also, again, forward that attachment. Oh, I'm sorry, you can download that attachment and then upload it to that virus total website. Um, or you can forward the attachment to Microsoft um, and then Microsoft would have, I don't know the domain or the email address off the top of my head, but there is an email that you could forward that to and they could scan it for you as well. All right, we're getting lots of awesome questions. All right, let's keep going. We have here one from um, Jeffrey. What would be the best practice norm for deletion of emails and how do you prevent employees from keeping emails past the best practice state? Good question, Jeffrey. Yeah, that is a good question. So a lot of that comes down to what you're required to keep um, based on like if you if you're state regulators are requiring you if you're an insurance agency to you know to keep records for seven years um, but overall the best way to do that is to implement things called retention policies as well as archiving um, and you can do that if you are in office 365 you can set up those things and what they'll do is after a certain amount of time retention will then remove that data you can also classify by using tags based on sensitive information so a tag in this resource over here, we'll tag all the things that have a social security number. That tag then says, hey, after four, three years, these need to be archived. And then after a three additional years, they need to be removed. So if you're not aware of how to set that up, because it can get a little bit complicated, I would suggest reaching out to whoever's managing your email. Um, and they could kind of walk you through that process of, of getting that set up based on what your requirements are. All right, thanks, Dylan. All right, we have a question from Joshua. And he says, what would be your top three uh, computer security programs like Bit Bitdefender and things like that? Um, I know that they will not necessarily prevent a spam email from getting to your inbox, but they will maybe flag them and prevent a computer from being compromised, as you mentioned earlier. So top three security um, programs. So it would really depend if we're talking about, if we're talking native to the computer, not necessarily protection within the email client. Um, you know, normal antivirus, Defender, Microsoft's Defender for Business, Defender for Endpoints, a big one. Um, 
that utilizes things like managed detection and response or extended detection and response, MDR, EDR platforms, um, which kind of work in a different way that antivirus does is that they look for anom anomalies on the network. Um, so if you download an attachment and, and it you know installs some random program that's you know evading normal antivirus, it looks for that types of stuff, those types of things. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely a good EDR platform. Um, a good vulnerability scanning platform as well. The Defender for Endpoint is is something that would would do that as well. Um, and honestly, you know, having your firewall lock, your Windows firewall locked down to only allow necessary services can play a, a huge role in in protecting you as well. All right, thank you, thanks, Joshua. No we worries. do have a question here from Julie. Any tips on creating and enforcing a policy where salespeople have company email on a bring your own device, BYOD? These salespeople are out in the field and at times accessing email on the public Wi-Fi. Sure. Um, so I'm just going to assume you're using Microsoft 365, um, but if correct me if you're not. With the whole pandemic and everything, the BYOD devices, work from home and personal devices and stuff like that, you know, has changed drastically when it comes to what is allowed and what isn't allowed. But what also has changed is the certain controls that we can have on those devices. So there's things called mobile application management. Um, so when you sign into your email account, your Outlook account on your phone or a laptop, um, there's two separate enrollment processes. There's joined and then there's registered. Um, joined is usually used on corporate owned devices. That means that the people who are managing those devices in the back end have full control. But when it comes to personal devices, um, they are just registered. And with registered devices, you can actually use what we call MAM or mobile access management or mobile application management. So what that does is it allows you to utilize native Microsoft applications on those personal devices, and it isolates those devices from all of the personal data on the, on the phone or on the laptop so that we can strictly enforce controls on that specific application and not touch any of the personal data. So I'm kind of somebody that's for the use of personal devices nowadays, so long as we can implement these types of controls in them. So one of the things that you could do is you could require a phone have a passcode to be able to access their, their email or the email won't sync. Um, if they, so let's say somebody doesn't want to have a, a passcode on their phone, well, you can in, enforce a passcode directly on the Outlook application on the phone as well. Um, and again, none of this is touching any of the personal data, but it allows you to enforce some sort of controls to make sure that your, your organization's data is safe. Great Hope question. That answers that Julie. question. Yeah, thank you. All right, we have a question from Barbara regarding storing contact information. Could you clarify if we should not be storing contacts and contact information, um, such as email contacts and additional information in our Outlook contacts? Um, no, I, using the contacts or storing your contacts should be fine. Um, okay. it, you know, if the account's compromised, they can pull all of those contacts, but Again, just having somebody's email address isn't really the biggest threat. Um, it's all the additional information that they can get on them. Because if we really wanted to find somebody's email address, we wouldn't necessarily have to compromise your account to find it. It's out there somewhere. So okay, the risk okay. is low, is what I would say. All right. Um, just two more questions. What happens if I fall for a phishing attempt and my account is compromised? Well, um, there are different strategies when it comes to mitigating an active compromise. Um, and it really depends on the type of service that has been hacked and what type of data was potentially stolen. Um, so if it's a business related account um, and you have a dedicated IT team, it's always best to notify a security professional as soon as possible um, as they may need to notify maybe some state regulators or federal regulators. Um, if it's a personal account compromise, uh, you'll want to change your password, of course. Um, enable MFA if you haven't already, and you know, force log out any active sessions if possible. Um, if it's a financial account, 
it's always the best to enroll in, you know, a credit monitoring service through your bank or your credit card. All right. What are some signs or red flags that my account may have been compromised? Will I know if that happens? Unfortunately, there isn't a single thing to look for to determine whether or not an account has been secured after, um, you know, a compromise once you go to secure it. So, however, there are some things that what we call IOCs or indication of compromise um, that you can look out for. So some of the IOCs for like an email compromise, for example, may be, you know, weird mail forwards to external addresses, um, inbox rules that are deleting or moving messages to other folders, um, authentication attempts from strange geographical locations are, is another one. And any out of place configuration changes is something to keep an eye out for too. Okay. All right. And I believe that wraps us up for questions today. So Great. thank you all so much for attending today's security awareness training. We hope that what you learned today will prove useful in helping you stay safe from any type of phishing attempts. The Kite Tech team is here to help. If you would like to set up a brief call, to discuss your technology needs, or if you have clients that could use our help, please don't hesitate to reach out to us using any of the ways listed here. We'd be happy to provide some guidance or recommendations uh, based on your needs. And just a reminder that we do have another webinar coming up on November 17th on Microsoft 365. It's gonna be a great session all about navigating the Microsoft 365 landscape and how to get the most value from your investment. And thank you so much again for joining us, and we hope you have a great rest of your week. Take care now.